Okay, so maybe we should get going then. So hi everyone, my name is Dion Filmer, the director of the bank's uh, research department. Um, welcome to this uh, policy research talk. Um, as some of you may know, these talks provide us an opportunity to present work coming out of the World Bank's research department with the goal of sharing the findings with colleagues inside and outside the department, along with others outside the World Bank. Um, welcome to our audience, both on WebEx and on YouTube. Um, today's talk is going to focus on bank lending in developing countries, where large inefficiencies limiting the flow of funds towards productive borrowers still remain. Um, my colleague Claudia will discuss how access to novel data sets can help us understand the dynamics of bank lending as well as the effects of public policies affecting banks. Based on her recent work, she's going to illustrate cases in which banks lack incentives to allocate credit to productive firms and the effectiveness of policy initiatives aimed at supporting the banking sector, including policies adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm very grateful to have uh, Maria Gua Guadamias as a discussant today. Mario is a practice manager in the finance, competitiveness, and innovation global practice. Prior to this, he helped coordinate the joint World Bank Financial Sector Assessment Program, the World Bank participation in the Financial Stability Board, and provided assistance to countries in the banking regulation and supervisory area. Uh, previously, he was a senior financial economist for Black, leading bank operational work. Um, Mario has numerous publications on financial sector issues, notably on financial infrastructure. So the run of show today is going to be, I'll turn it over to Claudia, who will talk for approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll invite Mario to talk for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and we'll conclude the session with the Q&A from the audience. Um, for those of you who have participated in some of these before, we're going to try something slightly different today, which is if you'd like um, to ask your question live, which provides slightly more animated engagement, um, Ryan will need to turn on that functionality. Um, so just in the chat, just put uh, that you'd like to ask a question, and then when we start the Q&A, um, uh, Ryan will turn on your video and audio so you can uh, pose your question live. If you'd like me to just read the, the question, uh, just type it in the chat and, and, and I can read it uh, out loud. So without further ado, let's turn it over to, to Claudia. Thank you, Dion. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, do you see in the screen? OK. So thank you everyone for connecting. Uh, today's talk is going to be on bank lending for inclusive uh, growth and the role of incentives uh, in, in bank lending. So to get started, I wanted to first uh, show you two figures. So here, what I am plotting is the credit to private sector uh, by banks uh, over the GDP of a country and how this relates to two indicators. The first one is the GDP per capita of the country, and the second one is the percentage of uh, the poor population of a country. And clearly what I wanted to show you here is that there is a very strong relation, positive relation, between a bank lending uh, to a country and the GDP per capita of a country. And similarly, we see a very negative, clear relation between more bank lending in a country and the percentage of the population that is considered poor. And of course, here, there's only a, a, a this is only a correlation, but we actually know more about this relation. And actually, we know that financial development promotes inclusive growth. Uh, we have an extensive research that documents that greater financial development helps reduce the cost of external finance to firms. And in doing so, it helps increase economic output. It helps firms, uh, or it, it helps the opening of new firms. Uh, we also know for, from a series of studies that greater financial development helps relax credit constraints that are particularly binding uh, for poorer individuals. So by doing this, uh, greater financial development can reduce poverty and inequality. So the main mechanism that different studies have highlighted uh, on how or why uh, more efficient credit markets can help is that more efficient credit markets encourage uh, more savings, and they also promote a better uh, um, and more efficient allocation of capital 
And by doing this, uh, more efficient credit markets stimulate entrepreneurship and increase employment. So then the key question here is how can regulation and what is the role of regulators here to improve the efficiency of credit markets? And we, again, have a large body of evidence that highlights what policies work. And in my group, in DECFP, we have actually produced uh, five global financial development reports now that summarize a, a large part of, of this research and what are the key findings and key messages uh, to, to, uh, to, to help credit markets become more efficient. And from this research, we know that a key message for regulators is to work on legal frameworks that promote financial stability, that strengthen creditor rights, that promote transparency, and that address market failures. But throughout these policy messages, one message that uh, is uh, highlighted in uh, many studies is the role of incentives and how incentives of banks matter. And specifically, when regulators are designing uh, interventions or regulation, uh, it is important to align this regulation to the private uh, to align the private incentives of banks to the public interest. So, as Ross Levin stated it in 2011, what regulators should avoid or, or should aim is to discourage banks from undertaking profitable investments that may be socially harmful. So this is where uh, this is what I will be discussing today in this talk. So in my talk, I'm going to focus on the banking sector. I do this as the banking sector is the main source of credit in developing countries. And throughout this talk, I'm going to share with you and discuss four case studies. And uh, throughout these studies, I'm going to showcase how banks' incentives uh, can shape and actually do shape the credit supply of an economy and its financial stability. Uh, so jumping right away to the first case study, uh, I'm going to be talking as, about the incentives that banks have to lend to the government. And the big question in this paper, uh, 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 in this ongoing work, is whether these incentives of banks to lend to the government actually end up making uh, or facilitating a crowding out uh, of firms away from, uh, from the credit markets as banks are more uh, uh, attracted to lend to the government. And the second big question that this paper wants to answer is if this crowding out exists, what is the impact of undoing it? So the context of this paper is Mexico, and what we're going to study is the introduction of uh, the financial discipline law, a new law that took place in 2016. And uh, just uh, and this law, uh, the objective of this law was to restrict the local public debt. So just as context, in Mexico, subnational governments began increasing their debt since the global financial crisis of 2008. And most, uh, most or, or the largest uh, part of this debt was coming from private commercial banks. Uh, importantly, when uh, local governments acquire, acquire debt, uh, there was this implicit uh, warrantor that was the central government. And this is important because for the eyes, in the eyes of banks, uh, lending to local governments implied carried very little risk because the central government was warranting implicitly this debt. Uh, and, and the interest rates were pretty attractive. So uh, local governments were a very attractive uh, client for commercial banks. Uh, when the federal government, by looking at this uh, trend, increasing trend on debt growth uh, from local governments, decided to introduce this law in 2016 that limited the debt of, of local governments. And the way this, uh, this law worked was by establishing some ceilings above which subnational debt was banned. So here in the figure, you can see uh, how the debt ratio of countries looked like one quarter prior to the introduction of the financial discipline law. And what you can see straight ahead is that out of the 32 states in Mexico, there were some states with, with debt uh, ratio levels or with debt levels above 100% of their GDP, not above, but almost uh, close to the to 100% of their GDP, whereas other states had debt uh, ratios uh, substantially lower. So in principle, what this law is doing 
is uh, binding uh, more heavily states with higher public debt. So what we're going to be doing in this study is use the universe of bank loans in Mexico uh, to study how bank lending uh, changed after this law, not only to the government, to subnational governments, but also to firms. So just as a summary of what we're finding, so when we look at how bank lending to local governments evolved, and here we're comparing bank lending as local governments had, uh, had higher uh, debt levels before the, before the introduction of this law, what we see is that right after the introduction of this law, the amount of lending that banks uh, were injecting to local governments with higher debt Begin contracting, began, begins contracting relative to the amount of debt that they still inject to state with low uh, government debt. So what we take from this is that uh, the, the law was effective in stopping the debt that highly indebted governments uh, were acquiring, were obtaining. And together with this, we see that uh, how bank lending to local firms uh, is affected. And what we see is that the same banks that begin contracting their debt to local governments are increasing their debt to local private firms in the same states where they are contracting their debt. So how we read this is uh, that uh, we're finding evidence consistent with an unwinding of uh, crowding out. And we think these results are uh, uh, having uh, important economic effects because we follow, our, uh, follow up states and what we see is that after the law, the state that had more indebted government contracted their public expenditure, and this probably is coming from the fact that they now don't have access to this tool that is debt. So uh, by losing this uh, possibility of uh, contracting debt, they end up contracting their public expenditure. However, and uh, uh, surprisingly perhaps, we see that these states begin increasing their GDP. And together with this increase in GDP, we see that they reduce unemployment level, and we also find that moderate poverty in this state is going down. So, so when we look at these uh, aggregate outcomes, we then follow uh, the analysis using firm level data, and we confirm that firms in the states that, uh, were, that had higher debt levels before the reform are indeed expanding their economic activity. We see them investing more acquiring more assets, hiring more workers. So this is very consistent with our aggregate results that GDP in this state is growing. However, we also find that along these results, the share of uh, uh, households living uh, under extreme poverty is going up in this state. And uh, in ongoing work, we're trying to, to distill what is uh, driving this result. It is likely resulting from the contraction in public expenditure. Uh, but uh, here we will need more work to, to, to pin down this, uh, this result. But all in all, what I wanted to take, uh, to, uh, what I want you to take from this case study is uh, what we're learning, uh, that weak limits on accumulation of local public debt and especially implicit warranties by the central government may incentivize banks to lend to local governments because they have low delinquency and high interest rates. Uh, and this is important because banks then, uh, or what we see is that local and especially smaller private firms are crowded out from the debt market. Uh, so clearly here the policy recommendation is that limits on local public debt can help channel bank lending to, private se to the private sector and trigger economic growth. Uh, we also uh, believe that uh, implicit central government warranty can lead to higher than optimal levels of local public debt. So this is something important for regulators to monitor. And finally, this result on extreme poverty is also highlighting the need to not only identify, but correct any disruption that uh, is taking place of social, on social programs. So let me now move for, uh, to our second, or to the second case study that I will discuss today. So in this second case study, uh, I focus on what are the incentives that banks have to invest in screening SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And the big question I think that uh, we answer in this study, in this paper, is whether banks have incentives to expand credit supply to underserved firms. So 
this uh, work is co-authored uh, with Miriam Brun, my colleague at the World Bank, and uh, Irania Rice and Rodolfo Stulke and Ben Ross. And uh, for this paper, we actually work uh, or focus in Peru. So what we do is we work with one of the largest banks in Peru that was interested in uh, expanding its business uh, towards the small and medium enterprises segment, so the SMEs. So uh, at the time, this segment was dominated by other banks and also by other non-bank financial institutions. So in Peru, uh, you can think of the Cajas Municipales were a big player on, on uh, lending to the SMEs. And what our partner banks did to get introduced into this segment was to pilot a new tool to screen SMEs that were applying for a loan. So this new tool was based on psychometrics, and uh, this tool yielded a three-digit score, so a very similar credit score to what other traditional credit scores uh, use. And this tool was actually used uh, by our partner bank to screen about 1,883 SMEs that applied for a working capital loan. And how it worked in practice is that our partner bank selected a threshold uh, based on this scoring, and SMEs that scored above the cutoff were offered automatically a loan, whereas SMEs that scored below this cutoff were only offered a loan if a loan officer considered the, or, or approved the application. So what we're going to use uh, in this paper is data not only from administrative data from our partner bank on these clients or on, on these loan applicants, but also we obtain data from uh, the Credit Bureau Equifax in Peru to follow all these 1,883 SMEs and to study how the uh, changes in their credit supply took place after they applied to this loan. So let me show you here uh, the distribution of the scores of these uh, 1,883 SMEs. And remember here, so here we're normalizing the cut of around zero. So in the light blue part of the figure, you can see SMEs that score above the threshold. So for these SMEs, the probability of obtaining a loan offer, not a loan, but a loan offer, from our partner bank was one. Everyone obtained a loan offer. However, for SMEs that scored below zero, so this is the dark blue area, the probability of obtaining a loan offer uh, was less than one. So only, a, uh, only some of these uh, SMEs ended up obtaining the loan offer. So this is exactly what we're going to be exploiting in, in this paper. But however, you can, uh, of course you can tell me that uh, an SME that, score, uh, that had a score of 50 is not gonna be very comparable to an SME that scored a minus 100. So what we end up doing is focusing on a narrow bandwidth around this cutoff where SMEs are more comparable. And in this, when we do this, we see that the SMEs that are left around the cutoff at the time of the application uh, of, the, of, the, of their loan application are pretty similar uh, below and above the, the cutoff. So we see this in a series of uh, characteristics. So here I'm showing you three. So the likelihood of having, this SME is having a loan uh, with another uh, financial institution six months before applying to, for a loan with our partner bank is very similar around the cutoff as, uh, as they are the sales of the SMEs and the age of the owners of these SMEs. So we don't see any difference uh, below and above the cutoff. So what we're uh, at the end of the day using is uh, the SMEs below the cutoff as our control group, whereas the SMEs above the cutoff are SMEs that increase the probability, there was a discontinuous increase in the probability of obtaining a loan offer. So, what, so this is going to help us understand what happened to this group. So then what we do is follow these SMEs six months after they applied for a loan with our partner bank. And remember that we know that SMEs to the right of the cutoff obtain a loan offer from our partner bank. So what do we see? So let me first show you what we find for the SMEs that we classify as SIG file applicants. So SIG file applicants are SMEs that have established credit history. And, and what we see actually in these figures is the probability that these SMEs actually obtain already a loan from either our partner bank in the figure to the left or from other financial institutions that are competing with our partner bank. So this includes banks and non-bank financial institutions. So what we see is that big file applicants 
uh, that apply for a loan offer uh, and that pass uh, the scores, uh, their scores were above the cutoff, indeed increase the likelihood of obtaining a loan from our partner bank by 34 percentage points. But what we and we don't see any change in the likelihood of them of obtaining new loans uh, from other uh, lenders. But what is interesting to us is when we move uh, to study what happened to SMEs with thin file credit history. So these are SMEs that don't have an established credit history. And importantly, what we find is that the likelihood that these firms obtained a loan from our partner bank uh, increased in 13 percentage points, but it's not statistically significant. But however, if you see at the right figure, we do see that the SMEs above the cutoff that were seen filed actually increased uh, the probability of getting a loan from the competitors of our bank, uh, of our partner bank. So what does this mean? So implicitly what this means is that the profit of thin file SMEs were captured by other lenders and not by our partner bank. So the, and here you can see that in this regression, what we see is that the profit uh, from these SMEs above the cutoff that were considered thin file applicants, uh, the profit that these SMEs had for other financial in institutions uh, increased in about 300 percent, whereas, uh, whereas our partner bank did not have any statistically increase in, in its profits from having screened these applicants. So what do we learn from these second case studies on the incentives that banks have to screen SMEs that don't have established credit history? So what we learn is that investing in screening underserved borrowers entails a private cost because these technologies are uh, to screen SMEs uh, and obtain information on these SMEs, particularly if they don't have any other established uh, uh, information. So these uh, technologies are costly, but they end up producing a public good. And the public good is that whenever an institution, a, a bank, gives you a loan offer, this loan offer carries a lot of information and a signal that you were approved uh, 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 and you were, uh, you were deemed as a, a client uh, that would pay back a loan. So, so at the end of the day, banks may underinvest in expanding credit supply to underserved borrowers. So, Clearly here, the policy recommendation from this type, uh, from this study is that uh, subsidizing private efforts to screen uh, customers with no credit uh, history may be a, a justified action for the, for the government, for the regulators. So uh, in the third case study that I wanted to, to present, to talk about, uh, I wanted to talk about the incentives that banks have to increase their risk taking and how these incentives matter not only for financial stability, but for the uh, efficient allocation of, uh, of, of, of capital uh, across firms. So the big question in this study is how do banks end up amplifying a sector-specific shock to other firms in the economy, and what consequences does this have? In this study, we focus on Mexico, and uh, uh, in particular, we focus at, uh, in a period of time where the price of oil uh, collapsed. So this is 2014, and here in the figure, you can see the price of a barrel of oil. So what we see is that uh, in 2013, 2014, the uh, price of a barrel of oil was around $100, and in mid 2014 uh, 14, very rapidly this uh, price moved to almost uh, around $50 the barrel. And uh, this drop in oil prices has been uh, studied in other uh, contexts. And uh, the, 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 what caused it, the, this sharp decline in energy prices, was caused by a very rapid uh, increase in the supply of oil. And this has to do with fracking in the U.S. So this was uh, fairly exogenous to, to the Mexican economy, which is what we study. And together, or as a result of this collapse in oil price, what we see is that the energy firms, not only in emerging markets, but also in Mexico, and here you see them in the blue dotted and dashed lines. So these energy firms begin increasing their credit default uh, uh, swap spread. So what does this mean? That these firms began, the credit risk of these firms begins, uh, begins increasing very rapidly. And this is because energy firms were severely hit as a result of this drop uh, 
uh, in oil prices. No, why the revenues just uh, uh, plummeted? So what we're going to what we do in this paper is use again work with the Central Bank of Mexico, which granted us access to the universe of bank loans in the country. And using this data, we're going to study how banks responded to this shock. So uh, in practice, what we're going to be doing is exploiting uh, the exposure that banks had prior to the shock to firms in the energy sector. So let me uh, explain what we mean by this. So, uh, so what we do is, for every bank, we calculate what was the exposure to the energy sector. And the way we define exposure is by looking at how much lending a bank is giving to firms in the energy sector as a percentage of the tier one capital of this bank. So just uh, I wanted to show you a figure to give you a, a, a hint of what we find. So once we calculate this exposure, uh, uh, in this figure, we're going to group banks according to the median exposure prior to the shock. So banks below the median are in the blue line and above the median, vice above the, above the median are in the represented in the red line. So what we see is that prior to the shock, uh, this exposure of uh, banks below the median was pretty stable, as was the one uh, for banks above the median. And right after the shock takes place, uh, banks with uh, lower exposure continue uh, with similar exposures uh, uh, to the energy sector. However, what we find is that for banks with higher exposures, if something, the exposure just uh, increased very largely and very rapidly. And so why, using this loan level data, we can actually learn why or how did these banks increase their exposure. And what we find is that what banks did was uh, beginning to extend new loans, particularly to large energy sector borrowers. And not only uh, banks begin injecting more credit to energy sector borrowers, but remember these energy sector borrowers are troubled borrowers in the sense that they are facing higher credit risk. So what banks are doing is injecting more, more, more credit to these firms at looser credit standards, meaning at lower interest rates than other banks were offering them and at lower uh, collateral requirements. Why are banks doing this? So this, this uh, strategy appears to be consistent with the uh, behavior of banks, to uh, of banks to try to contain losses and preserve their capital requirements. And we know that banks take on risk investment, and this is a uh, an issue that have been, has been raised and studied uh, a lot in, in, in banking. No, the profits of private, uh, the, the profits that banks obtain are privately captured, but any losses uh, are often publicly covered. No, as uh, governments end up uh, helping these banks if, if something goes wrong. So. So basically what I showed you is that these banks are injecting more lending to energy sector borrowers. So then the question is, uh, where is this lending coming from? So what we see using bank balance sheet data is that more exposed banks are not expanding their overall lending. And when we use loan level data among the sample of borrowers that are not in the energy sector, we actually see that banks, what they did is reallocate lending away from non-energy borrowers and into these troubled energy borrowers. Uh, this contraction in lending uh, among non-energy borrowers was concentrated among the smaller borrowers, as you can see here from our regressions. Uh, and also we find that of all the projects that uh, banks were financing, uh, banks begin cutting financing for investment projects. So, so all in all, this paper is giving us evidence of the bank credit channel, uh, the workings of the bank ch uh, credit channel. And what do I mean? What do, do I mean by this? Is we see that after the shock in energy prices, there was this consequent contraction in lending that eventually uh, con uh, amplified the shock to other uh, firms that were in otherwise healthy sectors, uh, which we see using firm level data ended up contracting their real outcomes. So. What I think we learn, or what we learn from this third uh, case study analyzing risk taking behavior of banks, is th that we document a case where banks have incentives to increase their exposure to a troubled sector uh, in order to what appears uh, to avoid recognizing credit losses and preserve their regulatory uh, capital ratios. And uh, 
But we also find that by increasing these risk exposures, uh, there, there, are negative impact, uh, there is a negative impact to uh, the aggregate economic output. Not only banks, we see are misallocating capital, so they are taking capital away from otherwise healthy sectors and into this uh, ailing sector. But we also see that banks are increasing their financial, expo their, their financial risk. So one policy recommendation that stems from this study is that uh, regulators may uh, want to limit sectoral exposures to prevent the amplification of shocks uh, via or driven by banks. And let me now move uh, to our fourth case study of today. So in this fourth case study, um, uh, I wanted to discuss what we know about the incentives that commercial private banks have uh, when participating in government credit programs. Uh, and I think one key question that we have when, uh, on this, in this study is to understand what are the strategies that banks use when channeling government sponsored loans that typically come, uh, come as below the market interest rates, at subsidized interest rates. So this work is co-authored with Alvaro Pedraza, my colleague at the World Bank, and two other researchers in the Banco Central do Brasil. So just as a bit of a context, uh, so uh, we know that government-driven uh, lending problem, uh, programs uh, that are channeled via private banks are very common in Brazil. And these programs are often referred to as uh, the earmark lending. So when I talk about earmark lending, I'm referring to these programs uh, that are a channel via private banks. So there are various interventions uh, in the earmark lending market that target different areas. There are earmark lending programs in agriculture or rural areas. There are earmark lending programs for mortgages. And there are earmark credit programs for firms. And this is one, uh, what we focus on. So, the main characteristics of loans in the earmark lending or earmark loans, and the first one is very important, the interest rates are regulated and set below market rates. And here we know a, a, a lot about the, the distortions that this already causes. No? So we know that interest rates uh, capture the risk of a firm. So the moment you set uh, an interest rate below the risk that this firm uh, really has, then banks are going to be discouraged from lending to this firm because there is no way they can compensate because the interest rate is not going to reflect the real risk that banks are uh, taking when lending to this firm. Um, so this is the first characteristic of your mark loans. The second characteristic is that how it works is that public funds are transferred to private banks and then the private banks are in charge of selecting, screening and selecting which firms are going to receive the year mark loan. And very importantly, in the case of Brazil and the programs that we study, uh, private banks will bear the credit risk. So if a loan uh, ends up defaulting, the cost is on the private bank that selected the firm. So as you can see from the figure to the right, uh, there was a large expansion of earmark lending by Venedes in 2008. So what this, firm, uh, what this figure shows you is the share of earmark credit that the average uh, firm in Brazil receives. Uh, by the different type of uh, program. So here you can see that the, before 2008, uh, about 2% of all the credit that a firm would get was coming from these earmark lending programs. And this share uh, began increasing right after the global financial crisis. And the reason it began increasing is that uh, Venedes, uh, the largest development bank in Brazil, launched the investment support program and this program aims to promote investments and capital expenditures among firms. And in particular, they aim to target the MSMEs, which were more uh, vulnerable for, uh, when, when this uh, global financial crisis took place. So MSMEs, remember, are the micro, small, and medium enterprises. And the way it, uh, the, the program aimed to help uh, these firms was by facilitating low-cost financing of uh, certain products, particularly fixed assets. So purchasing machine, machinery, purchasing vehicles. So, so this is what the program was focused on. So the first thing that we find actually from looking at just the raw data is that when we look at the share of firm credit received by, by, the type, by, 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 by the size of firms, what we see is that 
among all these micro, small, and medium enterprises, the program mostly ended up uh, going to the medium firms. No, so micro firms is something the share of earmark lending that they had is something it appears to have gone down after the program began for small firms we don't see much change if something it's there seems to be a small uh, increase and for for medium firms we we see a, a a larger increase after the program the other pattern that i wanted to discuss with you here is that uh, the share of earmark credit by type of bank uh, is also very different, and we see that larger banks, and here we're plotting the top five banks, larger banks more aggressively were interested in participating in the program. So this program uh, was a, a, a bank decided whether to participate or not, and here we can see that for uh, for top five banks in particular, it seemed uh, that it was a much more uh, appealing program. And then also just looking at the raw data, I wanted to show you how the interest rates of two different types of loan products look uh, and uh, how these interest rates vary for top five banks, largest banks versus other banks. So here what we see first is the interest rates of vehicle loans. And I put vehicle loans here because the Central Bank of Brazil actually gave us access to the universe of loans of vehicle loans and working capital. So our analysis is going to be centered in these two loan products. But it's very, uh, very nicely, we have uh, two products that are in the spectrum of the earmark market. No? So uh, on one hand, vehicle loans are uh, products that are offered in the earmark lending uh, market, and working capital loans are uh, the typical product that is not offered in the earmark lending product. So this is a, a much more clear free market, uh, free credit market product. So when we look at the interest rates of vehicle loans, we actually see that before and after the program, the interest rates charged by top five banks and the other banks are following each other closely. However, we found it interesting that the interest rates of working capital loans of top five banks seem to be uh, taking a, a, an opposite route or starting opening. There's a, there's a gap that begins opening from what the other banks were charging on these loans. So. So the question that this uh, brought us was whether larger banks were adjusting the prices of other loans when providing earmark loans. And to look at this issue, we then run regression analysis. So for this regression analysis, we concentrate on the sample of firms that already received earmarks, and we just look what happens at what happens to the interest rates on other loans uh, that these firms are taking after these firms begin a earmark credit relationship with their bank. So this means that after they receive a first earmark, what happens to the interest rates on other loan products? And what we see is evidence that the bank that gives a firm an earmark, when this same firm uh, uh, obtains a working capital loan right after this earmark, this working capital loan is going to come at a higher interest rate. And we see this increase in interest rates uh, coming from what we call the inside bank, the bank that, gave, that gives uh, uh, the firm the earmark. Um, so uh, not only we see this effect, but we see that this effect is concentrated in smaller riskier firms, uh, which uh, we know are firms that carry, uh, that carry higher risk and for which earmark loans at subsidized interest rates may not be able to compensate this extra risk. This strategy is consistent or suggests that banks may be offsetting the risk of issuing or providing an earmark loan to a risky firm by adjusting the price that this risky firm is uh, paying in other loans, where banks have the ability to increase prices. Remember that in the earmark loans, they cannot increase this price. So what we learned uh, through this fourth case study uh, so we learned that loans at below market rates do not compensate lending to risk, riskier borrowers that we knew from before. But what we are, the novel finding in this paper is that we are finding how banks may compensate for this risk by adjusting interest rates in other loan products. And here the policy recommendation uh, is that channeling public funds to private banks will likely uh, benefit safer and larger borrowers and for risky borrowers, uh, what we find is that banks may adopt uh, different strategies to try to compensate for the risk uh, of lending uh, to these riskier borrowers. 
However, uh, in, in new work that we're starting, we want to, we're analyzing whether these strategies not only help banks compensate for the risk, but if these strategies may also allow uh, banks to gain profitable business uh, as uh, they can uh, use these earmarked loans to, for instance, increase product cross selling. And if this is the case, we're exploring whether we see this increase in interest rates uh, uh, concentrated in less competitive local markets within Brazil. And so these were the four uh, case studies that I wanted to talk. And uh, implicit in these case studies, I think, is the role that bank lending has on the economy. And this role has also been seen uh, in how the banks uh, have helped uh, the corporate sector during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we know that banks have been supplying the much needed funding to the private sector that is resulting from these lockdowns and these shutdowns of non-essential businesses. So in the last five minutes of my talk, I just wanted to briefly talk about what are we learning about the performance of the banking sector during the pandemic. And for these uh, last five minutes, I'm going to refer to a paper that uh, I'm working on together, uh, that we have together with Ashley de Mirgo Kunt and Alvaro Pedraza at the World Bank. So, uh, so looking at data on stock prices of publicly traded banks, so uh, we compiled this data set that covers 896 commercial banks uh, across 53 countries. And here in the figure, what you can see is how the stock returns uh, have evolved from January of this year to April. So what we're doing is comparing the stock returns of banks to other publicly traded firms in their domestic markets and to other non-bank financial firms uh, in their domestic market. So clearly what you can see from these two figures is that globally, bank stocks have been underperforming uh, relative to not only other publicly traded companies, but also compared to other uh, companies in the financial sector that are non-banks. So there's something inherent about banks that has been uh, making them more stressed than other corporates. And this may be coming from the fact that they are expected to provide this uh, key role in funding resources to the corporate sector. So in doing this uh, if funding or channeling this funding to the corporate sector, there has been there has been a wide range of financial sector interventions implemented to assist the banking sector. And these interventions can be classified in four groups. Um, the first one is monetary policy interventions. The second one is liquidity measures. The third one is prudential policies, and the fourth one is borrowing support programs. So. These interventions, of course, may impact, uh, while, while they may help in the short term, we also uh, know that they may impact the resilience of the banking sector in the longer term. And think of, for instance, interventions that relax the credit standards of banks in the short term so that they flow more money to vulnerable firms. These interventions in the medium term may come as a deterioration of the asset quality of a bank. So. Uh, we just, uh, so, so what we're going to do in this paper is assess the impact of the announcements of such measures on the performance of banks. And to do so, we exploit a data set that was collected by our colleagues at the FCI uh, Global Practice. And this data is uh, very cool. It uh, covers around 400 financial sector initiatives across 45 countries. So. Uh, it was a great effort uh, um, uh, that has helped us a lot understanding what is the impact of these policies. So um, in this talk, I'm going to focus just very briefly on two uh, of these measures. The first ones are prudential measures. And what are prudential measures? So these are measures aimed at temporarily relaxing the regulatory requirements of banks. Two examples, one from South Korea, so there, there was this loan deferment program for six months for the financially vulnerable individuals. And in Mexico, we also see uh, regulators uh, allowing flexibility so that banks can use their capital buffers. The other type of policy is borrowing assistance programs. So these programs are government-sponsored warranties typically for firms and households. So one example comes from Japan. So this was a package of $15 billion for small business loans. 
And in Romania, we have another example that was that the Ministry of Finance warranted up to 80% of the value of financing provided to SMEs. So using these data sets that collects what policies were announced and when they were announced, so we uh, used an event study methodology where we narrow our analysis to the, uh, the uh, uh, date in which these policy announcements were made. So here in the figure, you can see that our window of analysis is coming from one day prior to the announcement of a policy to three days after the policy was announced. And in the vertical black line, we see the announcement, the day of the announcement of the policy. And in the Y axis, we see we're plotting the accumulated abnormal returns of banks. So this means these are the uh, a positive accumulated abnormal returns are uh, returns that were that exceeded the expectations of the market. Uh, so basically, uh, investors the, the the response of uh, investors exceeded what they expected. No, or the uh, 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 yeah, exactly. So so what I wanted to say here is. What do we see when an announcement of a borrower assistance program is made? So what we see is that right in the day of the announcement, we already see an increase in the abnormal returns of banks. And this increase is actually pretty stable even after three days after the announcement of banks. And we did do a series of robustness checks to make sure that what we're capturing here is uh, the announcement of these, uh, of these borrower assistance programs. And on the other hand, uh, what do we see when prudential measurements are announced in a country. And it's something we see quite the opposite response. When a prudential measure is announced, on the day of the announcement, we see a negative, uh, a reduction, a contraction in the abnormal returns of banks. And this contraction appears to continue even after three days after the announcement of this policy. Uh, and now, not looking at on average uh, how average returns, uh, abnormal returns of banks behave around these announcements, but what we want to know is within the banks, which banks appear to benefit more from this announcement. So similarly, we're plotting the dates uh, uh, from announcements, and we're plotting in the y-axis the abnormal returns. But here we're plotting uh, also the characteristics, which bank characteristics appear to be more affected. And what we find in when a borrower assistance measure is announced is that these measures particularly benefit larger banks. So here, uh, the larger banks are coming in the red dashed line. So size, uh, so the greater the size, the greater the abnormal returns that banks are experiencing. And also, banks with lower liquidity pre, uh, provisions appear to pe perform better after these announcements are made. Uh, however, we know that these measures require significant fiscal commitment, and we actually find that there's a lot of heterogeneity across countries. Uh, this positive impact of borrower assistance uh, announcement of these measures is concentrated in developed countries, and we find no effect of uh, the announcement of these measures in developing countries. And we believe that this is related to the fact that in these countries there is less room for fiscal expansion. So news of these programs are less welcome because uh, the scale, uh, so, so, so markets are already internalizing this. So what we learned from this uh, final paper, so we know, so what we learned is that the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic has been more pronounced on banks than on other corporates. And here clearly the policy recommendation is that, well, not, not uh, some policies uh, appear to moderate the adverse impact for some banks, but not all measures uh, appear to work for all banks or in all circumstances. And in one example was the borrower assistance programs that uh, among all the policies, uh, these are the policies that appear to have the largest impact on abnormal bank returns. But due to their reliance on fiscal expenditures, these policies do not appear to work for all in all contexts. So just to close here my discussion, my final thoughts, are that uh, access to granular data in, in, in this field, in banking, has been key to understanding more mechanisms about how banks operate and uh, these incentives. So novel data repositories from banks, from credit bureaus, from credit registries are increasing our understanding on how bank incentives can shape not only credit supply, but also financial stability. And uh, regarding related to incentives, uh, uh, we, I hope I deliver the message that incentives of banks matter. Banks will be discouraged from investments that entail private costs but yield only public goods. 
and policies may unintendedly incentivize banks to take on riskier investments or to alter their credit supply. And here, of course, the key challenge for regulators is to how, uh, how design policies that align the private incentives with the public interest in order to minimize these uh, distortions from, uh, from banks. And uh, of course, identify and correct market failures in the credit market. So with this, let me close. Thank you very much. I'm happy to hear the discussion. Thanks, Claudia. Um, like you said, yeah, I think you did get the message across that incentives matter. So the, right. that's great. Thanks a lot for that really interesting presentation. Um, Mario, are, are you ready to, to come in? I uh, just want to let people know we have a few questions that have that have come in. Um, people don't seem to want to volunteer to say live, but we'll save those for uh, for the Q and A session. Uh, Mario, over to you. Hi, Dion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for the good presentation of, across all these very interesting papers. So, Dion, can you hear me well? Is the sound good? Yes, can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, great. So here, um, I have prepared my remarks uh, while in trying, uh, well, first of all, my name, as uh, you mentioned, is Mario Familias. Now I am responsible for, uh, at the World Bank for financial sector work in several of the Europe and uh, Central uh, Asia countries and also private sector. And of course, we are following uh, the sector very closely. And it's very interesting to read uh, uh, all these papers, uh, Claudia. Uh, so what I've done, I have been trying to think on what are some of the implications for our operational activity, trying to extract uh, beyond the specific uh, uh, analytic, uh, research analysis in each of the papers, what could be some lessons on what do we do uh, in terms of our engagements. I think they are uh, uh, very interesting ones. So. First, I will start uh, addressing uh, two uh, contextual issues, uh, and then I will go with uh, each of the four papers. What is that? I think is a good lesson for our operational engagement. And at the end, I will address the issue of COVID and what are the issues that are uh, worrying us uh, on the operational side on this. So, uh, Claudia, yes, you have said uh, incentives matter. I very much agree on that. Uh, indeed, I've been doing uh, in several uh, interventions in the past uh, with you uh, uh, on this point. So what is very interesting from my point of view is that uh, uh, before the global financial crisis, uh, there was the thinking that, uh, well, market discipline will uh, address any incentive issues and that uh, incentives will be aligned by the markets with some uh, limited regulation. And this idea with the Lehman Brothers and all the uh, that uh, happened afterwards, of course, uh, failed, at least. Uh, this is, was the major thinking. And then uh, we started at the well, international community started a very heavy uh, regulatory approach. Of course, in, in principle, uh, at the beginning with prudential norms, and then later extending to many other areas of the financial sector as risks were coming. Uh, more recently, for example, in, the, in terms of the fintech or cybersecurity or all these kind of things. So for me, and the quick question I wanted to know after all these years of uh, extensive and intensive uh, regulatory reform was to what extent uh, incentives had been properly incorporated by the regulation, because as we know, in previous cycles of regulation, it did the regulation. The issue is regulation was failing to address incentives many times. And then, of course, they were uh, regulation were circumvent and they were not, not effective. So my point is that while it is clear that the regulatory changes uh, have uh, put us in a very strong starting point compared to the global financial sector crisis, especially in terms of capital and liquidity, I don't think uh, the question of incentives is going to be able to be addressed or respond in a very clear way because before, uh, well, this was uh, possible, the uh, crisis has come and this crisis meaning uh, massive uh, uh, measures as you have described uh, in these more than 400 measures. We are also 
looking and monitoring those uh, for the ECA level as well. Uh, and these are basically misaligning incentives, but these are very much needed uh, because uh, authorities need to respond to the situation. So how much the regulation was effective or not is going to be difficult to know. And then also the more that uh, the uh, pandemic and the crisis last, the less we are going to know because then, of course, these measures are going to uh, generate some uh, uh, well, the misalignment on the incentives, the longer that they last, it's going to be more difficult to differentiate, well, what uh, were the uh, situations of uh, these borrowers that were in a better shape versus the ones that were not. Uh, so I think this is a bit of a initial reflection that I wanted to share. The other one is something that is very important, and you mentioned that you are going banking sector because it's the main source of uh, credit in developing economies. And of course, this is very much the case. I think uh, uh, one uh, issue I just want to mention that, uh, well, this is very much true, but at the same time, it's one of the biggest problems that we have in developing uh, economies, uh, because the lack of diversification makes these economies very dependent on the credit cycle. And when crisis comes, uh, the vulnerabilities to the credit cycle and the uh, exposure to the volatility is much higher. And this is not only a development issue, it is a very much financial stability issue. We have seen in some of the countries we operate how this end up to be, uh, well, uh, with a lot of foreign, uh, foreign exposures or other type of vulnerabilities. Uh, so this is a very challenging issue. I, we have been trying as this diversification agenda, but of course this is a, a slow process. No matter how challenging it is, I think it is very important uh, to pursue it. I just wanted to bring it because we're going to focus on the banking sector, but but I think this is critical on what we do, and it's indeed a very good complement to to the, all the cases that you brought. So now to the cases. Uh, I first of all talk about this. Uh, cases about the government as a borrower of banks. For me, this is a clear uh, case that exemplifies the importance of crowding, crowding in private sector. So, of course, you are analyzing the introduction of the 2016 financial discipline law in Mexico, and you come to the conclusion uh, that uh, limiting public local debt can help unwinding crowding out and trigger economic growth. I think this is very clear. I, I don't think we, we can disagree on that. And then it's a very intuitive outcome. What I want to, uh, to bring this into, uh, translate into what is the situation we are facing now. No? If we look into national governments all around the world uh, stepping in because it's needed, uh, and if we follow the outcome of your study, then the future will not be very flattering uh, with this outcome. Though, of course, there are the caveats that we are uh, applying this to a broader context. But I think what it tells us is uh, probably in the current situation, this is very much needed. There are no other alternatives, but uh, it is very important how this is done. And one of the issues we are looking in is uh, at the end of the day, uh, is how you can uh, uh, make the research in, in the economies and the financial sector. And if the public interventions in this case can uh, bring in through research mechanism uh, uh, the private sector in so, or financing because there is availability of liquidity, as we know in many uh, countries. So I think this is something that indeed we are looking and we have been uh, having requests for many countries on how to, to look into this issue. So this is in, in terms of uh, uh, the first uh, uh, one of the papers. The, the second one, uh, uh, or another one you have been talking about, is bank lending channel amplifying sectoral shocks. For me, this is a clear case of how uh, you introduce uh, externalities in bank risk assessments. And this is very important. Uh, your conclusion is banks with high exposure to a travel sector may have incentives uh, to increase their exposure even more consistent with the strategy uh, to contain losses and preserve uh, regulatory capital ratios. And of course, that makes the case that uh, 
uh, capital misallocation increase. And then you're mentioning the oil price collapse in 2014. I think this is a very clear case of all our discussion on the climate risks and the financial sector. Uh, a lot of discussion has gone so far on greening the financial, uh, the finance agenda uh, that is more on the development side. I want to bring the attention to the risk aspects of this agenda, no? because I think and uh, it's not only on the climate uh, risks, but in any other activity that banks are financing that uh, raises uh, some externalities. How do you incorporate these externalities so the effect of your study that you are mentioned doesn't happen? No? And of course, we know that uh, many supervisors around the world, and notably in Europe, the Central Bank, uh, the European Central Bank, but also others like the Bank of England, have issued some supervisory statements on how banks can integrate these climate risk assessments into their uh, assessments of risk as a broader or more integral part that we know has not happened. No, And this is, of course, some areas where we indeed uh, are trying or are looking into how we can help uh, uh, countries or um, uh, regulators to look. I just wanted to bring this for this specific sector, but apply to other sectors as well. And I think the, the, uh, the outcome of your study is very telling in this direction. Then you are talking about uh, the investment in screening uh, small and medium enterprises. For me, this is a clear case on how is it important to improve the enabling environment, no? So you, your conclusion is banks are incentivized to underinvest in expanding credit supply to underserved uh, borrowers because there is a private cost for a public good, no? And then you say, well, then in this case, subsidies to private sector efforts to expand financial inclusion may be justified. It is interesting, I worked on credit reporting system many years ago in Peru, so I know a bit about uh, this situation. So when I say this is a clear case on enabling environment, and for me, this relates very much to uh, the uh, financial infrastructure issues. And uh, what I mean, I mean financial infrastructure are, for example, credit reporting uh, systems or payment systems and the like. And I've been studying a bit about this uh, now many years ago. And one of the main issues that I learned about is uh, when you develop this system at the very early stages, there is competition across the different providers because this is what is going to determine the market share. And then when market share of uh, a specific market is more or less stable, then there is when there is an incentive on, on cooperation, and then they start to share the infrastructure. So in your case, it reminds me very much about this issue. And the question, uh, though for me, is not so much on subsidies per se, that as you know, we don't like very much because they may distort the market, but about what is the catalyst role that the public authorities or regulators can play in these early stages to incentive more cooperation in the infrastructure so the different uh, market players can compete more on the provision of the financial services. No? So I think this is uh, something that uh, I wanted to bring. And then a new aspect, I was the other day peer reviewing a project in MENA about financial infrastructure is how the situation is also changing because before there were in this uh, type of financial infrastructure, there were cases for barriers for the new entrants, but now with the new technology developments, and uh, it may be the case that, uh, uh, or that was what, what discussed today, that the incumbents may need to be protected from uh, others coming in. But this is, of course, very much beyond the paper and the discussion today. But I just wanted to bring because uh, it, uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion. So the other one you are mentioning is government intervention in the financial sector. For me, uh, this is a clear case on the importance to, to target uh, public sector interventions. And you see that uh, large firm firms, uh, that's your conclusion, disproportionately benefit from ER market credit program uh, because cross-selling strategies by banks are distorting market rates. And this is the ER market lending case in Brazil, no? 
So uh, this is something that interestingly we are very discussing very much now in several of our interventions in the bank through uh, uh, in liquidity. No, we since March we have had a lot of requests on supporting SMEs, but also supporting some credit lines. And of course, uh, because there are these uh, um, situations that you reflect in your paper, we have been trying to target to those that are in most need. But I have to say that this is in practical terms is very difficult also, because we need to combine uh, three important things. There is a quick need for liquidity that of course that will for not and then just pump uh, liquidity to the system, especially in the early phases of a crisis where you are trying. And as you mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a very diverse uh, impact because uh, some of the uh, countries are going to, to face the different uh, developing countries, the developed countries, and these are the most, uh, mo most in need of liquidity. It is important to ensure additionality, that is uh, from what other uh, and DFIs are doing, and also uh, it is important uh, to target to those segments that are most needed. So this balance is not easy. So finally, because I don't want to take a lot of time on the COVID, uh, so you uh, did an interesting analysis. You mentioned that the banks uh, have been affected more pronounced than all other corporates, I think uh, based on the stock price. Of course, because this is probably discounting what is going to happen in the future. That's not good, by the way, because when we see the real numbers, indeed, uh, other sectors uh, have been much more impacted immediately than the banking sector. But of course, look into the future. And you say that uh, there are some uh, policy measures uh, that uh, will have uh, different uh, uh, impact, no? And I agree. I think we are now seeing the tsunami. When the tsunami goes and some of these uh, measures go out, then we'll see how is the damage and who has been more damaged, who has been more damaged than others. Just two things here. Uh, we are really worried about this. We are we produce a paper in FinSAC, that is a group of financial experts based here in Vienna, where I am sitting on uh, stability issues that we look into borrower relief measures. And of course, these were needed, but the way they are implemented is very important. And then we are including a set of uh, specific recommendations for policymakers on how this can uh, be approached. And I don't want to go to this because I will eat a lot of uh, time there. And the other one, the other paper we are preparing on the MPL. Uh, of course, uh, we expect that this is going to end one way or the other affecting asset quality of the banks. And we have already a decade of experience in MPL resolution. So, of course, the good news is we have this decade of experience. The bad news is that this is a very long term and challenging agenda that requires a very complex holistic approach with uh, uh, intervention from regulators and supervisors with interventions for banks, and also with uh, a strengthened uh, legal em enabling environments from uh, insolvency and creditor rights, uh, that is. Uh. So here, let me, I can answer more details if there are then other interests, but, but in the interest of time, because I see we want to have a QA and a session, let me stop here and, and thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to read through these very interesting papers. No, thanks, Mario, and thanks for sort of reflecting on these findings via, you know, through the operational that operational lens. I think that was really that was really helpful. Um, Claudia, I don't know. We have some questions in the chat. Um, is there anything you wanted to just respond to very specifically from what Mario said, or should we could just beat up some questions and then you can kind of go through everything together? Uh, how would you like to proceed? No, I think I agree with uh, the discussion that Mario uh, has, so no much to add on that, so happy to take questions. Okay, and then Mario, if you if you have any opinions on these questions as well, feel free to come in after, after, after Claudio. So nobody's volunteered to go live, so let me just read off some of these questions. Um, first, we have from Ishani Kanpal, um, and I guess this is about uh, the case study number two. 
So she says, the psychometric tool sounds really interesting. Could you please tell us a little bit more about it? What does it measure? How does it differ from other tools typically used to screen loan applications? And then also, are there any potential distributional implications of switching to a psychometric tool for screening loan applications? So sort of some of the, are there potential negative consequences, I guess, in, in the distributional um, implications? Then we have uh, from Andrew Stone, he asks, what does the Brazil study tell us more broadly about the donor projects, about donor projects that pass lines of credit through the banking system intended to reach SMEs? So I guess sort of other broad implications. And then from uh, Rasek Niembro, apologies if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, if the performance of banks is measured by the price earnings ratio, the banks seem to be very strong. What would be the best way to transform a solid balance sheet into real COVID support for people in developing countries without violating a basic set of risk management rules? So those are the questions we've had so far. Over so, to you. Thank you. Let me start from the first one. And in the third one, I might also like to hear Mario's opinion because he's the expert on how uh, these policies, you know, what do we know about designing these policies um, and uh, minimizing these risk management rules or uh, taking into account these management rules. But starting from the first question that is uh, that uh, uh, on uh, these psychometric tools. So uh, I didn't uh, discuss much about this psychometric tool, but basically this psychometric tool is part of a series of technologies that have been uh, developing in recent years. Um, to try to assess or to obtain information about potential borrowers uh, from a new uh, sources of information. So usually we think of a, a traditional credit bureaus as a, the information, the, the, the generators of information to evaluate whether a firm or an individual can uh, is able to repay. The problem here is usually that in order to for you to appear in the credit bureau, you already have to have some experience uh, or some a, a past loan to 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 try to. Uh, and this uh, information is used to then assess whether you are going to repay it or not. And now there's a lot of push to getting these alternative uh, sources of information. And in the particular case of the bank that we worked uh, with. The tool that it used uh, is uh, basically a psychometric exam where anyone or the owner of the SME would uh, take the psychometric exam. By the time uh, this pilot took place, this psychometric exam was done in a tablet and it took about 30 to 40 minutes, I think. Uh, and there were some uh, questions uh, about uh, extracting information about the personality of the SME owner and uh, a restaking of this SME owner and uh, how how profitable an in, uh, a, a project that this SME owner uh, would undertake would be. So these personality traits were summarized on this uh, on this alternative credit score. And uh, I think now uh, you see a lot of these types of technologies, no, uh, using information on social media on psychometrics, on, uh, uh, I don't know, this, uh, uh, on other bills that the individuals and firms are paying outside the credit uh, market. So, but yes, in the case of this study was the psychometric test. In terms of distributional impact, so I think the hope for these technologies is that eventually we are able to actually open uh, up access to financing to, to vulnerable individuals and to underserved individuals and firms that do not appear in credit bureaus, which is a, a, which is likely because the coverage of credit bureaus in developing countries is not fantastic. So, so these these technologies could have a great uh, influence in a, how a credit is allocated. No, um, so that for the first question and on the second question. So I think uh, what we learned from Brazil, many things that we learned from Brazil are uh, applicable to other contexts. I think the first thing that we learned uh, from Brazil is uh, where are banks good at and where and what are the limitations of banks. So I think especially when you as a government are interested in reaching SME, uh, 
when you go for banks, what we see actually in Brazil is that banks go to their clients. So if SMEs are already banking with these banks, these SMEs are going to be likely benefiting from this program. So in the case of Brazil, we actually see that SMEs that were more likely to get these loans are SMEs that were banking with the top five banks. So the idea here is that if you as a government are aiming to target vulnerable SMEs uh, that are not uh, that are underserved already by banks, it is going to be hard to use banks to reach these SMEs. So this is uh, this is what we find in Brazil. Um, and um, so here, I don't know if other, uh, so we haven't done that, but we can perhaps look at whether smaller banks are better able to reach uh, smaller SMEs um, and understand a bit more how to reach the more vulnerable SMEs. And for the third question uh, about what is the best way to transform uh, the balance sheet of banks into COVID support, uh, I think uh, the way uh, the interventions, the details of these in, uh, interventions, uh, the way that these interventions are uh, uh, designed matters a lot. Uh, but uh, and the way uh, uh, for for what time period this is going to be working. But uh, so these details, I think, matter a lot for what we expect uh, the the impact uh, of of these interventions will be. But for this, I don't know. I'm curious to hear what, what Mario thinks and Mario's opinion, given his work on this area. Mario, would you like to come in on that one? Sure. No, I think uh, thank you very much for, for this question. This is a very interesting one, very difficult to answer. But but I, I, in the paper I was mentioning that we have been uh, doing in FinSAC, we look to this issue. Uh, in terms of what are the uh, implications of these measures for loan loss uh, cl uh, pro uh, classification and provisioning and for accounting, no? Uh, so one of the key aspects that uh, we want to highlight is after the global financial crisis, uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, work at the international level uh, to establish uh, regulatory frameworks that are aligned with international standards, no? So from our point of view, it is very important uh, that countries that apply these temporary measures uh, left a regulatory definition of non-performing exposures and for bond exposures intact, because this way at least different countries are measuring and then you will need uh, a bit uh, uh, what is the real situation once this uh, measure, when there is the exit from these measures, no? Otherwise, if you start to uh, um, well modify the standards definitions and so on, that took many years to achieve. Um, the good news is when we have been looking into all these uh, uh, measures uh, in uh, European countries, uh, at least we have seen very few countries. A few of them have changed these definitions. That is not good, but very few. Uh, and then we have seen also very useful uh, standards by EVA and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision to ensure that. The critical issue, and I think to, to is uh, the criterion on the unlikeliness to pay. And this is one that is critical in determining or apl applying the new regulatory framework for provisions. And this is very tricky, no? because this is what is going to tell you uh, what is the situation uh, and if there are some zombie borrowers, uh, but uh, this is at the same time tricky because it depends a lot on the uh, on the depth of the crisis, the duration of the crisis. So, uh, so I think this is uh, something that uh, probably the the situation when you look to the price earnings uh, is not so optimistic as you want to use the uh, the whole balance sheet that you see uh, to uh, to affect. And of course, there are also the accounting uh, implications, no? That, uh, uh, well, uh, and here it comes the uh, implementation of IFRS 9. As we know, here you need to, uh, to well, achieve a balance between the need to avoid the procyclicality, pro search on the provisions, uh, and maintain the spirit of the IFRS 9. Uh, this is not new. I think we have seen in other crises in the past. So, uh, not so much optimistic, I would say, in terms of using the balance sheet, and I would call for caution uh, 
though the question is uh, data is uh, not very clear now, so it's difficult to say at what point the balance sheets or to what extent balance sheets can be used. I think uh, to a certain extent, of course, needs to be used because the start point from the global financial sector crisis is better. So let me stop here on this. Thanks, Mario. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, we, I see a question has come in. Okay, it's a very long question uh, from, from ISA2. Um, so ISA2 asks, um, in your first talk, you're finding in the case of Mexico that limiting government borrowing limits the crowding out of the private sector and leads to the expansion of economic activity is consistent with your initial graph which showed access to finance or credit to the private sector, highly correlated with GDP growth. However, the related finding that extreme poverty increased seemed counterintuitive given the research data you shared at the beginning of the talk on the relationship between extreme poverty and access to finance. Do you think this finding is specific to Mexico or can this be extended to other countries? A related question is to what extent this policy recommendation is being taken on board in World Bank lending programs. Thank you for this question. A very interesting question. So the second part of the question, I don't know to what extent this policy recommendation will be taken uh, on board in World Bank lending programs, but let me uh, talk about the first question. So clearly when we look at the aggregate, we do see this negative correlation that countries that have more bank lending tend to have a lower population of individuals uh, that are considered poor. And in fact, what we see in the first case study is that when when banks reduce the amount of credit that is going to the governments and channel it to the private sector, we see that the private sector grows. And actually, we have two results that are very, I, I think they are very interesting uh, regarding the poverty uh, in this state. So what we see is that the moderate poor appears uh, appears to this model poor appear to decline and how I read this is that very likely the growth in employment uh, that is caused by the expansion of the private sector is helping some individuals that were moderately poor to exit this state and find jobs and uh, 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 and uh, succeed in, you know do, do better however the other finding that this uh, research is telling you is that there are going to be among the poor individuals that are not going to be jumping in this train of success. No, when the private sector is growing, there are going to be individuals that may be not benefiting so much uh, from this growth of the private sector. But uh, consider what we so so what we're looking in this experiment or case study is what happens not only when the private credit uh, from, when the private sector is growing, but when the public sector is shrinking. And what I, how I read this is that when the public sector is shrinking because it lost this tool of uh, having more debt. So part of this, uh, what we find actually is what, what the public sector does is to shrink their expenditures. And part of these expenditures may be uh, in the form of subsidies to, you know, social programs that were helping uh, individuals, the more vulnerable individuals in the state. So when the public sector begins shrinking, even though it generates this positive impact on the private sector, you still have left this vulnerable population that may have been may have been been in need of these social uh, programs that were cut. And um, this is why in the policy recommendations, uh, when 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 governments aim to limit the amount of public debt that local governments can acquire uh, or can obtain. Uh, one recommendation is to to be very uh, vigilant and identify a, a, and correct any change in the uh, social programs that were in place, no, uh, to correct these problems. Uh, this is how I reconcile uh, these results. So I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Claudia. Um, I think we're probably going to start wrapping up. Um, before doing so, uh, uh, let me just say, uh, Claudia, this, is, uh, this has been fascinating. I mean, you've documented just a ton of both sort of anticipated and unanticipated consequences of all these policies. Uh, uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting to, to follow. Um, so, but before closing, let me just turn it back to both Claudia and Mara in case they have uh, just a last comment to make and after which, uh, if, if they would like to make a comment, um, 
Mario, would you like to say anything? Yeah, so perhaps on the second question of, uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, and uh, of course, doubt because uh, we're not the government, but I think one very important aspect on our operational engagement is uh, crowding in private uh, financing. Uh, and it has been very intense since the beginning of the crisis. So this uh, pr private capital mobilization agenda that is becoming very high at the corporate level is a very clear case. And other interventions that we have seen through resharing mechanisms and the like, no? that precisely try to mobilize private financing. Uh, and it's not an issue of crowding out in this case, but it's an issue of crowding in private uh, contributions. So other than that, I, uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion. I'm very happy you invited me. And also, as I mentioned, the paper not only have the very good value already of the very detailed research, but also I think it's very useful uh, in terms of how could be or some thinking for our operational engagement. So, so thank you again for inviting me to, to this. Thanks, Mario. On my side, uh, and on my side, I only, only no more things to say on my side. Only wanted to thank Mario. Mario, I, I knew that the discussion was going to be very interesting and you didn't disappoint. So thank you very much. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank Mario again for, 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 for joining us for this. And, and, and thank you, Claudia, for a really great, interesting and clear presentation. I think I, mean, I certainly learned a lot and I expect everybody else did too. Uh, thanks to everybody who's been following on, on WebEx and, and YouTube. Um, with that, let me, let me close. And, and for those of us here in Washington, maybe go and get some lunch, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.